Uh, thanks again for the introduction and uh, thanks for having me today. Um, we heard in the prior talk how um, how on edge processing can basically enhance the um, privacy level of our computations. And obviously, um, machine learning is one um, very interesting aspect um, for doing so. So today I'm going to be talking about federated learning on IoT devices. Um, and I want to start off by giving a little bit of um, motivation. Um, why are we looking into this? So if you look at IoT today, and um, especially IoT in relation to machine learning, um, the situation that we're usually in is that we have our IoT devices. And those IoT devices, they produce um, data. They produce data. Um, if, we, if we consider smartphones to be IoT devices, then they those produce um, data by users interacting um, with mobile applications running on these smartphones. But another IoT devices um, produce data by, um, for example, um, collecting sensor input. And the data collected on these devices, um, usually if we have to, if we want to do machine learning on these, um, if we want to learn from this data, we first um, have to start by collecting all of this data in a central place. So that's um, often nowadays um, the cloud. So we have to upload all of this data to the cloud. And then we have basically um, one giant data set that we then use um, to train our models on. And that's um, obviously um, for privacy reasons, um, not an ideal situation, but then there's also other situations where we simply cannot do this. Um, because the data on the edge is just um, the data volume on the edge is just too large. If we think about, um, we, I mean, prior we heard um, about self-driving cars, for example. And if we think about a self-driving car having eight cameras um, in, in in all directions, um, the entire stream of data coming from these sensors is just um, too much to upload it um, all the time um, to the cloud. And then if we look at machine learning stack that we have in, um, in, in, the, in, the, in our traditional um, setup where we do all of the machine learning in the cloud, the stack is actually quite simple. So we usually have a Linux machine with some kind of accelerator like a GPU or a TPU. Um, we have um, high bandwidth connections um, if we train on a cluster of machines. And um, probably the biggest choice that we have to take is whether we implement our workflow in um, TensorFlow or PyTorch. Um, if we now look at federated learning, um, this situation looks a little bit different. Um, federated learning is this idea of basically um, turning, turning the whole thing upside down. Instead of sending the data to the model, we send the machine learning model to the data. So this means in the cloud we only have, or in our central instance, we only have our machine learning model. And then we send that model to our IoT edge devices. And the model is then being trained on these devices, on the local data on these devices. And we do this for a little bit. We train the, um, the model a little bit on these devices. And then we send back the model, the, the refined model, um, to the cloud. And we do this over um, a set of devices. And we receive these local updates in the cloud. And then what we do is we aggregate these updates to form one new global model. And that model hopefully then contains the learnings um, from all these local data sets. And by doing so, um, we arrive at a model that, that contains the learning um, without, um, and, and we have this model in a, in a central place, without the central place um, having ever seen a single um, data example um, from the local devices. So all of the data stays on these devices. And if we now compare this, this setup um, to the traditional machine learning stack, um, we suddenly see that um, this is much more heterogeneous. It is much more, much more complex because um, we move our training to these um, edge devices. We suddenly um, have to deal um, with um, varying amounts of uh, connectivity. So we don't just have um, ethernet, but we also have um, other things like Wi-Fi or 4G, 5G. We suddenly have a whole um, variety of different platforms. We have um, all major desktop operating systems, but we also have iOS and Android um, and embedded devices. We suddenly have um, very uh, varying um, degrees of uh, hardware acceleration. Some of these devices just have CPUs. Then there's um, new developments, like for example, the Edge TPU or um, the neural engine and Apple devices. Um, when it comes to frameworks, we also have to take a closer look because those um, server-grade um, machine learning frameworks like TensorFlow or PyTorch, 
they're not necessarily the best fit to do machine learning on these edge devices. And we, we might need to move to something different like um, PF Lite for model personalization or um, uh, using C++ in combination with LibTorch um, for maximum performance. And um, then we have other factors influencing the, the training progress, um, like the locality of the data. Previously, um, data was in a, in a single region. Now we have data um, at least multi-region or often, oftentimes on a global scale. And the data in these individual partitions is not always IID distributed, but it's usually um, non-IID. But at the same time, this, this heterogeneity um, is also a huge opportunity, of course. And um, here in the, in the Moises um, community, we are pretty much aware of that, um, that um, previously computation mainly happened on servers and then um, a little bit increasingly on smartphones as well. Um, but um, during the last couple of years, we really saw an explosion of new kinds of uh, categories of edge devices. We see consumer drones, we see consumer robotics, we see smart manufacturing, um, uh, smart devices like smartwatches and smart speakers, um, but also then um, certain industry verticals adopting these ideas like um, uh, agriculture, for example. And then another challenge that we have is um, we have a whole range of machine learning projects um, that are open source, that are well maintained. So the last time I checked when I searched GitHub uh, for machine learning projects, there were 328,000 machine learning projects. And um, if we're now moving to the edge and, and if we move to, to, to doing machine learning on the edge, it would be wonderful if we could uh, just leverage this, uh, this existing body of knowledge and a lot of sweat and tears went into building these projects. Um, and it would be great if we could leverage this um, and, uh, and, and transition these um, to the edge as well. But of course, this is a challenge. So with that, I would like to introduce Flower. Um, we call it the Friendly Federated Learning Framework. Um, Flower is an open source framework under Apache 2.0 license. If you want to learn more, um, please feel free to check out flower.dev. And what Flower does is um, it provides exactly this infrastructure um, that I was describing earlier. Flower provides a way to easily plug in edge devices, um, like for example, a, a smart home device, like a, um, like a home robotics device, for example. Um, plug these into a, a larger setup, into a larger network of connected devices, and then um, allows you, and then, then Flower allows you to um, implement um, your workloads on top of this um, federation of devices. So it allows you to perform, for example, federated learning um, on top of the, these devices, but it also brings infrastructure to do um, additional things like monitoring and validation that, that, that are required um, in order to, to build such systems um, that are then eventually being um, deployed into production as well. And the vision is really um, behind Flower to, to provide um, one way and provide an easy way um, uh, to plug in these devices and then to build machine learning workloads based on um, existing machine learning projects and run these machine le learning workloads in a federated fashion across these devices. So um, the key differentiators of Flower are um, usability on the one hand, I, I already touched upon this. Um, Flower allows you to easily build these workloads with um, as little as 20 lines of code, um, build a fully fledged federated learning um, system, including the server, including the clients, including um, uh, TensorFlow-based um, model training on the edge. We also engineered Flower from the ground up to be very scalable because um, in the IoT community, um, we know that the scale of devices, the number of devices that we can have in such workloads can be tremendous. Um, so there's even um, some of these workloads include um, up to millions of devices. And um, of course, an, an infrastructure um, that wants to be, that wants to leverage this needs to be able to handle a large number of um, participating devices. Compositionality is another aspect um, that is quite important to tackle the challenge of um, heterogeneity. Um, so Flower is compatible out of the box with different machine learning frameworks. Um, so it's not limited, um, it, it doesn't force you into using a similar single framework, um, but it allows you to build your, your um, edge workloads in, in a variety of frameworks. And then of course, um, compatibility with different platforms and even with different programming languages is, um, is really um, a, a key aspect um, to support um, this large variety of devices. 
So how does Flower um, achieve these goals? Um, Flower under the hood um, uh, builds upon a very modular architecture. So if we start on the, on the top right-hand side, this is basically your existing machine learning project. And this is the thing that we want to run on the actual edge device. So these, um, this existing project, it consists of um, some local data set, um, the data that is being collected on these IoT devices, and then a training pipeline implemented in some kind of machine learning framework. So for example, implemented in PyTorch. And what we do then um, with the framework is um, we provide a utility to, um, to easily plug into this existing machine learning pipeline or plug this pipeline um, basically into Flower. And then um, the Flower client um, uh, under the hood, it uses a, um, an RPC client um, that communicates um, with the Flower server with basically the, the RPC side on the Flower server. Um, and this RPC stack is then being used by the federated learning loop um, to perform um, federated learnings across these devices. Um, so, we, so we deploy the stack across um, a bunch of devices um, and then the server side um, can um, select these devices, um, send them the global model, um, order them to, to train the model on the local data um, or do something else. And then on the server side, um, Flower is flexible as well. So you can, um, using an, a plugin architecture, you can bring your own strategies that define um, how to perform this federated learning. So there are different strategies for um, selecting the clients, um, for aggregating the updates that we receive from the clients, for instructing clients to, to train for um, an, any number of epochs and things like that. And um, when, when people start out building these systems, they usually start out um, using um, one of these um, existing built-in strategies. And then later on, um, if these workloads get more advanced, um, they, they, they will usually move on to, to implementing their own strategies. And then one small aspect, but I think um, especially in the, in the IoT community, um, very much appreciated, is the possibility to um, not only build clients using Python, but also to build clients um, basically using, using almost any programming language. So the, um, the, the, the way federated learning is being performed on the server is pretty much agnostic towards um, the software stack that is running on the client. And um, you can actually go ahead and um, bring your own programming language, um, connect, um, use it to establish a connection to the server, and then handle the events that are coming from the server um, and, um, and, and implement that um, in the programming language um, of your choice. So with that, I would like to go into um, a couple of examples how this, the, the flexibility of this framework can be used um, to, to customize uh, um, your, your um, particular workload. So the first example um, that I want to start with is um, mobile. So in mobile, um, we know that um, we have um, either Android clients or, or iOS clients. And on Android, um, we usually program um, using the Java programming language. And on iOS, we usually, usually use the Swift programming language. Um, so with that, we already see that this, uh, this possibility of using um, other pro programming languages other than Python comes in quite handy. Mobile platforms have um, usually really good support for gRPC communication. So we, um, on the client side, we use the stack of the Java SDK. Um, we, we might use um, TensorFlow Lite um, for model personalization um, on the local data. And then we use gRPC to communicate with the server. And we do have um, obviously two implementations, um, one based on Java for Android um, phones and one based on Swift um, for, for iOS based devices. Um, they co connect um, to the server through gRPC and then the server side uses plain federated averaging um, to run the federation across these devices. Another example is the HPC example. So um, before we deploy these workloads into production, we usually want to make sure that um, given a large number of clients, um, the models that we want to train still converge. Um, and um, we do this by using large scale simulation. For large scale simulation, um, many researchers have access to some kind of compute cluster that they can leverage for their simulations. And in the case of such a compute cluster, we actually don't want to use um, a single machine just as a single client, but we want to run um, a, a large number of clients on a single machine. 
And for that, um, we are building an infrastructure where we uh, switch out gRPC and, and exchange gRPC and use um, Ray instead, which is um, a very good match for cluster-based simulations. And then um, when we perform these cluster-based simulations, because our cluster is usually running Linux and has very good support for Python, we can actually implement the client um, using Python, using um, the standard server-grade server um, machine learning um, frameworks like TensorFlow and um, do that um, to, to, to check um, whether, our, um, whether our workload will still converge. And um, while we are experimenting, maybe we realize that something is not working as it intended. Um, so we can then start to customize the strategy, where, whereas we um, previously we started with just the federated averaging strategy, which is the, the plain federated um, learning algorithm. Um, we can now um, start to customize the strategy um, to, to really um, optimize it for our workload. And then the last example I want to show is um, really geared um, towards IoT. We know that in, in IoT, um, the devices that we can have, they can vary quite a lot um, when it comes to their hardware capabilities um, and, and software capabilities. And in such a setting where we have um, very different IoT devices, we might even have different requirements when it comes to um, the way um, that, we, that we use to connect these devices to the server. So maybe we have um, some very, a very low powered device um, that, we can, um, that we can only program using C++ um, for performance reasons. And this low power device, the best way to connect this low power device um, is uh, through MQTT, for example. Um, so the vision for the Flower Framework is really to enable these um, mixed kind of workloads where we have different clients connected through different, um, different um, communication protocols, basically. Um, so we can mix this, a, a, this MQTT client, um, have this MQTT client in the same workload um, as we have other clients that are maybe have better support for, for Python, for gRPC. So these other clients, um, they are connected through gRPC. And the federated learning loop um, and the strategy that we run on top of it, they are entirely agnostic um, of the way that values are being communicated um, between client and server. So um, they, can, they, can, they can operate um, on all of these clients um, without knowing um, how these clients communicate um, with the server um, communication stack. So Flower is really um, based, um, Flower is really um, a core framework um, that, uh, that provides these abstractions to build these workloads. And then around the core framework, um, we are currently building an ecosystem of, um, for example, code examples that we can use to easily start off um, building these workloads baselines um, that can be used to compare own federated um, learning approaches or ideas um, against existing ones. Um, we want to provide data sets for these baselines. Um, we want to, um, we, we already provide a couple of strategies out of the box that you can use um, uh, basically plug and play in your workloads um, to, to compare how well they perform in your, in your um, actual situation. And then we're, we've just started to build client SDKs um, other than Python. So there's a pull request open for a Java client and um, work has started on building a C++ client. And then um, other, um, other um, machine learning frameworks and, um, and toolkits have started to provide integrations um, with Flower. So for example, we have a longstanding um, collaboration with the speech train team um, to, to build um, great support um, for, for making speech fan and Flower um, work well together. So we recently announced Flower 0.16 and um, there are a, a couple of changes that I won't go into detail too much now. Um, but I think the most exciting, um, uh, the most exciting announcement um, that I want to highlight is that we um, moved from alpha um, to beta status. And I think um, given the, the workloads that we've seen that people implemented based on the Flow framework, um, moving this to and announcing beta uh, stability is more than justified. So Flower has been uh, received um, in, a, in a very positive way. We have um, users for the Flower framework in both academia um, and industry. So there's um, a couple of leading universities um, using Flower um, and, and um, a, a whole list of papers based on the Flower framework 
um, that are doing some 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 cutting edge things, like for example, um, investigating the CO2 impact of um, federated learning workloads. And then um, industry adoption has also been been great. Um, we are we are seeing um, very interesting uh, cases being built there. If you want to learn more about the underlying ideas um, behind the flower framework, feel free um, to um, check out the paper that we have on archive. And um, with that, I, I want to just want to say that um, Flower's mission is really to provide one solution um, for all the way from research um, to production. So we want to do, Flower wants to do um, what uh, for federated learning, what TensorFlow has done for um, centralized machine learning. And um, basically um, before, before we had TensorFlow for centralized machine learning, um, we had researchers build very custom systems to explore ideas. And then once those ideas were um, sort of, um, so, so once these ideas started to work out, um, they basically, um, engineers, software engineers had to start from scratch um, to, to um, adopt these ideas and really build them into a, into a work, working production system. And this is sort of the um, situation um, that, that we are in, in, in federated learning. So federated learning um, was only introduced a couple of years ago and um, federated learning systems usually also started out in research um, and, and, were, um, and used toolkits that only allowed researchers to build simulations of these systems. And then um, when you wanted to transition such a system into a production scenario, you basically had to start from scratch and, and, and build a fully custom system um, for your workload. And Flower um, obviously um, wants to change that. Flower's um, mission is really to, to give you um, one toolkit that you can use um, to start out in, an, in a very exploratory way. So build a, a small system, a, a small system prototype um, on, a, on a developer machine. And then usually if you transition these federated learning workloads towards production, there's a couple of steps that you want to take. So after building a first prototype, usually the next step is to scale up this prototype and simulate it with a much larger number of clients. Simulate it um, with a larger number of clients to see um, whether the hyperparameters and, and, and the model and everything still um, work out well when you have um, the data distributed across more clients. And this is not always trivial. So you want to simulate that before going into production. The next step after that is usually to bring the system to an actual device that um, has um, very similar or um, ideally the same hardware characteristics as the device that you um, want to deploy it um, to um, in, the, in the final system. So you want to um, perform some um, evaluation on, for example, um, a cluster of Raspberry Pi devices see if the, if the model training pipeline is still um, working out, um, even if you have um, limited um, hardware resources, for example, um, see how it, how it works with the connectivity and, and things like that. And once, um, once this is validated as well, then usually these workloads um, are in a, um, in, a, in a good position um, to bring them, um, to start to deploy them um, to production. And really, um, Flow wants to allow you um, to, to, to gradually take these workloads and, and gradually enhance them um, and, and support all this way um, from research to production. So um, no presentation is complete without a meme nowadays. Um, I, I just want to leave you with the thought. Um, even though it was, uh, it used to be quite difficult to build these systems and, and a lot of knowledge on both the machine learning and uh, distributed system side was required. Now, um, given frameworks like Flower, it has become actually pretty easy. So it's, it's quite easy to take an existing workload, an existing machine learning project, and just add a couple of lines of code um, to federate um, this existing project. So now I want to go into some um, research results um, that are obviously not just mine, but that there's um, a, a whole range of people involved in, in obtaining these. And um, the first one um, is really um, the thing that I hinted at earlier is a quantification of the carbon impact of federated learning. So um, this was actually something that, um, at least to me personally, it was quite surprising. Initially, my expectations was that um, federated learning would be worse in terms of carbon impact because we have this additional communication between clients and servers. 
but um, it turned out um, that there's one factor um, in this um, in this entire quantification that can actually lead um, to the, to a situation where um, federated learning is in some cases better in terms of carbon impact compared to centralized learnings. And the reason for it um, is uh, seems to be quite obvious in hindsight. But um, in on the server side, um, when we train um, in a central fashion then we usually have to actively cool um, the accelerators um, performing these computations. And of course, this cooling um, requires a lot of energy. In federated learning, on the other hand, um, we train on passively cooled edge devices. And um, because we, we, we have just passive cooling, uh, we don't need to waste energy on, on cooling these devices. So that was, uh, was, was, was quite a surprising result um, and then quite a nice one too. Another result um, was looking at um, uh, compute and network um, heterogeneity. So in, in one instance, um, we mixed um, GPU only clients um, with, um, with some clients having only a, a CPU acceleration. And obviously um, this is probably not, not very surprising. If you have a single CPU client, um, this can um, sort of have a, a similar implications um, as, as stragglers do in, in distributed systems. Um, we also measured, um, um, for example, the, the impact of um, network heterogeneity on these workloads. Um, and again, we can see if we have um, clients that are connected, um, that, that have poor connectivity and, and maybe a very low bandwidth, that they can um, delay progress on these workloads if there's no strategy on the server side um, that, that, that prevents this. And then the last result um, I want to share is on scalability and stability. Um, on the right hand side, you can see the plot of an image net training um, on, a, on a shared machine that um, ran for more than two weeks. So, so uh, on close to 15 days. Um, this was in a, actually in a very early phase of flower. And um, we were um, actually um, we, we were quite happy that, that it worked out so well um, in, in, in such an early phase for the, for the framework. And then on the left-hand side, this is a scalability experiment um, where we run the same workload across a varying number of clients. So going all the way from 10 clients to 50, to 100, to 500, to 1,000. And um, we measure the impact of um, having more clients and having the data distributed across more clients on the convergence um, of the model. In this case, um, it was a um, very um, simple CNN trained on the CIFAR 10 um, data set. And with that, I'm um, already at the end of my presentation um, and I'm happy to go into Q and A. And then again, I would like to encourage you to um, join the, the Flower community, um, uh, take a look at the website, flower.dev or reach out to me personally.